that is um, right here, you might see some stars. And does anybody recognize this constellation here? It's Orion. So this is how we see, this is our visible universe from Earth. If you look with the naked eye, you see approximately 4,000 stars. When we go further, what this movie is going to show, we are slowly going to get away from our Earth, um, looking at our Milky Way, our own galaxy from, from outside, which is something you cannot really do except for in computer simulations, and then looking at our closest galaxies as well as our closest clusters of galaxies. So this is a movie in which every single star you see is exactly where it is in reality. Pictures are real. You can now see we are going to the Orion. Orion is disappearing because it's just a chance projection. So we are going further into Orion. And you are starting to recognize this one, possibly. This is the Orion Nebulae, the onset of, um, this is the birthplace of many stars. Going further in, this is the Horsehead Nebula. You can see this prominent red color, which is a gaseous material, which is being lit up by the surrounding stars. The reason why it's red is because it's all hydrogen, and hydrogen um, emits one of the transitions in hydrogen um, is in visible red light. So this is now Rosetta Nebula. And you see all these nebulae are actually in our own Milky Way. We are still in a disk of our Milky Way. We are slowly flying around. We will shortly encounter the Crab Nebulae, which hosts a very well-known pulsar. That's the Crab Nebula. And we are now slowly getting away from the plane of the Milky Way and we'll look at our own Milky Way from above. And this is going to happen in a second. We can see already the center of our Milky Way, which is in the constellation Sagittarius, if you look from the Earth. And now looking from above, you see our own Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. You see the prominent spiral arms. So this is what we can conclude from knowing where all the stars are and putting them in simulations. So now we are going away from the Milky Way and we are slowly going to approach our closest, um, closest galaxy. And the closest galaxy is Andromeda Galaxy with its companion. Um, and this is another, this is M33, which has a very prominent star formation going on. So there are a lot of stars being born in those clouds. We are flying yet even further away from it, and we are soon going to see the galaxies. Now, everything is realistic in this simulation. So um, stars are where they are. They're exactly the color they are. They're exactly the brightness they are. The only thing uh, people from NCSA faked a little is they made the galaxies 10 times bigger because there is enormous amount of empty space. And so you wouldn't be able to see anything. So they just enlarged the images, which are Hubble images in part uh, of the galaxies. And so here we now see the closest galaxy cluster to us. So this is approximately 1,000 galaxies, all gravitationally bound together. And uh, we will soon be flying into the center of the galaxy cluster, which has a very prominent galaxy in the middle. And this galaxy is so big that it actually emits material from the center which is seen as a blue type of jet. So this is gas being expelled, and you will be able to see it in a second. So this is M87. You go in, and there is the blue jet shooting material out of, out of the um, galaxy. So this is the light side of the universe. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of scale, so just to count how much material we have. I, I was telling you we mostly see empty space, but if you think about it, our solar system contains one star, our sun, right? And then the Milky Way, which is our galaxy, contains about 100 billion stars. So 100 billion stars just in our galaxy. Now we know that there are more than 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So if you want to know the number of stars in the universe, you have to multiply this huge number with this huge number. So it's a gigantic amount of material only in stars. And to give you a bit of a sense of scale, let me start by our solar system, which is 
13 light hours wide. So from the sun to the Pluto. Pluto might not be the planet anymore, but he's still belonging to our solar system. There is 13 light hours. The light emitted from the sun takes 13 hours to reach Pluto. And if you put this on a scale, let's build up this system now, and you say, OK, let's assume this distance is only 0 0.01 of a millimeter, so the thickness of a hair. So imagine the solar system being right here at the thickness of the hair. We go further, and we reach the closest star. You saw how quickly in simulation you reach the closest star, which is Proxima Centauris. It's 4.3 light years. So the light takes 4.3 years to reach the, that star. And so that would be on the same scales, one meter. So here is our solar system. A meter away, we have the closest star. What you also saw in the movie is the Orion Nebulae. Orion Nebulae is still in our galaxy 1,500 light years away, which is 240 meters, somewhere up there. So we are getting far away. Now we are going to the closest galaxy to us. That's M31, which is very, very far away, 2.5 million light years, which is 250 miles on those same scales. That means in Santa Barbara. Now building up this system is, is, um, uh, would still be doable. 250 miles is not that far away. At least I'm trying to convince myself that. But if you want to go to the closest cluster, which is Virgo cluster, which is 60 million light years away. This will take 6,000 miles, which is all the way back in Europe where I'm from. So these are the scales astronomers are dealing with. And those 60, so now you know that 60 million years took the light to travel from the Virgo cluster to us. We saw the movie in only two minutes. So, and just because I really like it, I'm going to show it once again. Now that you know the scales, now you can probably grasp the proportions of what the simulation is all showing us. So here we are again at the Orion. And all these distances, so we already passed the stars. We are now getting to a few hundred meters away from us. And this is the Orion Nebulae. It's just amazing. Sorry. <laughs> it's just amazing what are the proportions. And yet, even though there is so many stars, the space is basically empty. You, you don't see much in between, which is um, sometimes difficult to grasp, really. And so the Milky Way, which is really thick, in, in fact, and really big, basically becomes very flimsy when you think about how how big the whole universe is. From us to the Big Bang is 30.7 billion light years. So the light would take 30.7 billion years to reach us. So these are amazing numbers, which I cannot really picture in my head properly, to be honest. So here we are again at the disk of the Milky Way. We see it rotating. And this is how our Milky Way would look like if we would be able to see it from the outside. Unfortunately, we sit within the Milky Way, so we never uh, see those images. But with computer simulations, we are able to reconstruct from knowing where the, where all the stars are, where the gas is. We can reconstruct how things look, how things would look if we would be able to look at them. So this is again M31, the Andromeda galaxy in the back. You can actually see this one with the naked eye. Again, not from Palo Alto, but uh, if you are reach a dark sky, you can actually see it. So this is a galaxy cluster. We will be talking about galaxy clusters today a lot. And this is a filamentary structure. So all these galaxy clusters are, are bind with these sort of bridges. And this is a thousand galaxies, which are all gravitationally bound to each other. So they all know about each other. And so um, this type of object is what we are going to be dealing most about today. But now, looking at the simulation, this was now only the light side of the universe. You would think, this is it. This is all we can see. 
And it turns out that this is yet a very, very minor part of everything that we have in our universe. There is a lot more in our universe than just those nice looking galaxies and a gas. This is a very minor part of everything that we know of. And so today I'm going to focus not on what we can see, but what we actually cannot see, but we know it's there. So, and I'm going to start back in the history. How do we know there is more material than what we can just see? And we weren't the first one to figure that out. Um, it was already back in the 30s that Fritz Wicke looked at a galaxy cluster. So this is a galaxy cluster, a, com a conglomerate of around 1,000 galaxies. You see them here all in orangey colors. These all galaxies move around each other. They all belong together. And what Fritz Wicke, who was um, very brilliant in his mind, but also very difficult to work with, he was working at Caltech, did, he actually measured the velocities of all these galaxies. So he measured the velocities and figured out, hang on, these galaxies move way too fast. So you should imagine this like a sort of, if you have a gas cloud, and if the molecules are moving too fast, the glass cloud would fall apart. Exactly the same thing uh, is what Zwicky did use from this, from this galaxy cluster, yet it's holding together. So there is something that must hold it together because the mass in the galaxies, he knew how to calculate the mass in the galaxies, was not enough to keep this cluster together. So he, he called this particular material that holds this cluster together the invisible matter. Later, this term has become dark matter, which we are going to, to uh, focus today. Later, in the 70s, Vera Rubin now doesn't look anymore at galaxy clusters, but at individual galaxies. So this is one galaxy just like our Milky Way. What Vera Rubin did is she measured how fast this galaxy rotates. And so what, I, what is plotted here is the velocity as a function from distance from the center. So if you're close to the center, this galaxy is spinning around very fast. And just like you know in a planetary systems, so our planets, the further out you get, the slower they get. So you're expecting, if you're outside the galaxies, that the velocity with which material circles around the center of a galaxy should fall down um, further and further. And this is what we expect. So this is the curve one would expect if a galaxy was made only out of visible material. You would expect this um, curve to decline. But Vera discovered that actually doesn't decline. It stays constant. And that was remarkable. She again discovered dark matter. She wanted to go to grad school in Princeton, and she was not admitted because they said they don't take any girls. <laughs> so fortunately, this is not the case anymore. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. But um, she has made an outstanding career with, with her observations. And it's to her that we know now that there is dark matter in galaxies as well. And now going even further in time, only a couple of years back, George Smoot and John Mather, George Smoot is uh, actually just across the bay in Berkeley, got a Nobel Prize for discovering dark matter in the universe in yet another experiment. So what they did, it was called the Kobe experiment, is they looked at the time when universe was only 300,000 years old. Remember, I told you the universe is 13.7 billion years old. And so if you take 300,000 years old, you get to 13.4. And this is when those tiny little fluctuations, this is now the whole sky. This is how we see the whole sky in the microwave frequencies. So the same frequencies as your microwave oven gives away. But what we can see here are these tiny little fluctuations. So all these contrasts that you see here are basically tiny little seeds from which galaxy will later form. So we have these tiny little clumps of material, and they will get more clumps of material around them, and that's how galaxies form. And so they saw this image, and what they, what they did with it is they put it in a big supercomputer and say, OK, if this is our baby universe, how would the universe look today? Turns out, if you just do this blindly like that, 
we wouldn't be here, our Earth wouldn't form, our galaxy wouldn't form, things would be completely different. The universe as we know it wouldn't exist. Turns out you have to put dark matter inside in order to get the universe that we know of today. And so this was yet another conclusion that yes, there is dark matter in the universe. And so right now astronomers are kind of fortunate in which we know what our universe is made of. The slightly unfortunate thing is that all the particles ever measured on Earth, all the particles ever detected in accelerators, this table, this room, our Earth, everything we know of and we are kind of familiar and happy with goes into that 4%. So 4% is the material we know. 4% is the material we have detected and we get it in our textbooks of particle physics. 25% of all the universe is made out of dark matter. I'm going to show you today how we are getting hold of dark matter, how we are uh, starting to understand what dark matter actually is. And yet there is this even bigger part of the pie that I'm not going to talk about today, which is dark energy. And so from that, we know very little about. So in order to figure out what dark matter really is, I told you we cannot detect it here, we cannot just turn on our accelerator and, and say, okay, this is dark matter. What we need to do is we go back to Tsvikis time and we go back to galaxy clusters. So galaxy clusters, the way Tsviki observed them, I told you there is 1,000 galaxies, so it's approximately 1,000 trillion stars in a cluster of galaxies, huge number of stars. Yet those stars are not massive enough to hold cluster together. You need 50 times more material um, in order to hold this cluster together. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because we observe galaxy clusters. This is a galaxy cluster as it's observed with Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope is a telescope up in space, as the name uh, says. And it's the telescope that I've been mostly using to do my, to do my research. And um, so this telescope actually observed this galaxy cluster and all these orange galaxies belong to the same cluster. So they're all physically together. It's not a chance projection like Orion. They're actually physically bound together. And so you look at them, you measure their mass, you measure their velocities, and you figure out, yes, there must be something more. There must be 50 times more material. And this is not just this cluster or the cluster Tsviki observed. This is now true for hundreds of clusters that we know of. So there is something missing here. What Zwicky didn't know is that clusters are not made only of galaxies, they're also made of gas. And the gas, the reason why Zwicky didn't know about it is because the gas is very, very hot. It's 13 to 100 million degrees Celsius. So I wouldn't stick my fingers in that. And that gas, because it's so hot, actually shines in x-rays. So the same x-rays you have when you go to, the, to your doctor this is the frequency with which this, this gas shines. Now, our atmosphere is um, opaque for those, so the, fr the x-rays cannot come down through our atmosphere, which is great because if it would, we probably would be dead by now. It's really not that great to be sh shown by x-rays all the time. But it's not great for astronomers because, well, we need to go up in space again in order to observe this gas. And so this is the Chandra Space Telescope. It's another telescope up in space um, that observed clusters. And this is what the clusters look like with Chandra. Those two dots are completely irrelevant for now. They're not related to the cluster. What you have to um, look at is this fluffy material. And this is basically a hot gas. And with those observations, we can then tell how much mass there is in, in a gas. And so you can measure how much mass it is in a gas, and it turns out that gas is the dominant material that shines in a cluster. So galaxies times six in mass, it's hot gas. So there is six times more gas than there is galaxies. But even if you put both of those together, right? Now we've found yet another material that is holding clusters together, but it's still not enough. There is 10 times more material that is needed in order to hold these clusters together. So how do we see it? And you would think, well, this is impossible. We, we looked in all frequency. We, we cannot see anything, so it must not be there. Maybe there is something wrong. 
Well, there is yet another way to see it, and it's called gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is a great tool because you can measure masses of clusters, no matter if it's luminous, if it's dark, if you can see it or not. And the way gravitational lensing works, so now I have to imagine this is our galaxy cluster, which acts like a lens. Just imagine the lens that you have in order to, uh, the magnifying glass. So this is our lens. This is our telescope that is observing. And this is our galaxy, which is way behind the, the cluster. So we have a galaxy, completely unrelated, cluster, and now we are here on Earth and we are observing it. What this background galaxy does is it shines light in all directions. And so if you think about it, if I'm that galaxy and you are observing and in between there is a cluster, if this cluster wasn't there, what you would see is you would see me directly on a straight line because the light rays that will hit you will go straight. Now, if you put a cluster in between, what happens is the light rays get banned. So if a light ray goes straight, it would actually nick and it would go in a completely different direction and it would miss you, so you wouldn't see me. You wouldn't see me where I'm standing. But what happens is, the light rays that would otherwise go a little bit further out then get nicked and then they come together. And these are the light rays you would see. And this is exactly what's pictured here. So this is the straight light ray which doesn't hit you because of the cluster, but what hits you is this one and this one. And so instead of seeing galaxy where it actually is, what you see is two images of the same galaxy and one in this direction and one in this direction. So you would see two images of me at each side of myself. Now you can imagine the same happens if the light goes down or if the light goes up. And I'm not really not making this up because this happens in nature. <laughs> so what I'm showing here are two galaxies. This green little smudge is a galaxy, this yellow smudge is a galaxy, and a cluster of galaxies. And so what you can see here is one, two, three, four images of the same galaxy. There is only one galaxy behind it, but because the light has been banned, you can see multiple images. Sometimes when images are, are bigger, they can get smeared out and you can see this almost perfect ring. So if you have a circular geometry, you would get light rays coming from all directions and you would actually form a ring. And this is a part of the ring that you see here. Now in clusters, things are a bit more complicated because things are not very clumpy the way you see here, but maybe you can see this part of the ring and there is another counter down here and there is this part of the ring and so this is all due to gravitational lensing. This is because the light rays don't go. In reality, all those galaxies that you see here are actually somewhere in the middle here. But because the light has been banned, um, they appear somewhere else. In addition, the more the light is bent, the more massive the lens is. So you can actually tell how much mass there is in a lens by looking at how far those images go apart. And so this is how we measure masses of a cluster. And today I'm going to present you with a very special cluster, which is called the bullet cluster. The name of it will become apparent uh, in a minute and it's this gigantic number of light years away from us. So it's very, very far away, although in terms of clusters, not really that far away. If you put this back on our system that we had before, this is 500,000 miles, which is the distance to the moon and back. So you remember before the closest cluster was in Europe, now the next uh, the cluster we are going to talk about today is going to be to the moon and back, so very far away. But um, the good thing about this cluster is it's nice, slightly complicated, but um, you will see why it's, so, um, why it's so nice to study dark matter with it. So what you see here is now again the image that the Hubble Space Telescope took. So now we are back into the optical, we see the galaxies, and all these orangey galaxies belong to the cluster. But what we see now is unlike before when we just have a big bunch of galaxies all together, we actually see two of two bunches of galaxies. So there is one and there is the other. This cluster of galaxies is actually two clusters which lie very close together. And so now we know where the galaxies are. And the big surprise came 
when we actually looked at the X-ray. So now back to Chandra. This is the still optical image in the bottom and X-rays on top. So now we see where the gas is. Well, first of all, we see that the gas is not anymore associated with galaxies. It's in between. It's not where the galaxies are. It's in between. But in addition, what we see is this prominent um, shape, which is just like the bullet flying through the air, if you ever saw those images. Um, it's, that's why it got nicknamed the bullet cluster. I don't really like the bullets. Um, maybe an analogy would be a surfer. <laughs> it's not exactly right, because the velocities involved with surfing are quite a bit smaller than when clusters collide. But it's the same type of, you get this type of conical shape. Um, you can also see it when a boat is flowing through, through the, through the um, sea. So this actually told us that what happened is that this small cluster has smashed through the big cluster and is flying now away. And so it's creating this kind of a shape behind it, just like a surfer going through the water. And so additional information that we got from those observations is 100 million degree gas, it's extremely hot cluster. It's one of the hottest clusters that we know of. And that those two components, the big cluster and the small cluster, actually collided at a speed of 10 million miles per hour. It's gigantic. It's uh, one of the biggest um, collisions after the Big Bang that happened in the universe. The collision happened 100 million years before this image was taken. And so with the X-rays and optical, what we know now is we had two clusters. They both had their own gas. But now they smash through each other, are now flying apart. But the gas, because it's so much friction and it's, it's this particular shape that it forms, it's lagging behind. So the galaxies go straight through because there is only a couple of galaxies and they don't really see each other. They're flying away this way now and this way. But the gas is being, there is, was a lot of motion in the gas and so it's being left behind. And this is approximately the trajectory with which the small cluster flew through the big cluster. So what does that got to do with dark matter? Well, there is no dark matter there yet, but this cluster is yet another example where galaxies move too fast. So something must hold it together. And so let us go back to gravitational lensing. Let us do the gravitational lensing experiment with our cluster of galaxies. And so these are now the real images. These are just the tiny little images from the cluster that I've been showing before. And I will try to explain you what is lensing here. So I was telling you that you see two images of the same galaxy. Now how do you know these are two images of the same galaxy and not just two galaxies sitting there? Well, if you look at this image and this image, you would probably spot similarities. In addition, what we know, Lensing flips images. So those two blobs are those two blobs, and this little tail is this little tail. And so this is how we find multiple images. There are big arcs like the one I showed you before. There is a tiny V here and a tiny V here, which is kind of hard to see because it's behind a galaxy. This is what gravitational lensing is all about. You look at those pairs, you look at those distortions, you look at those images. and you would think, oh yeah, that's easy. You just look at them. Well, every single galaxy that is circled here is the one we use. So there is a lot of staring, a lot of computer programming, a lot of uh, data analysis that goes into that. But it's all those galaxies that are now encircled with, ra with red circles that we use and do gravitational lensing. So we use the information, and now we know where the mass is. And we know how much of it there is. And the somewhat surprising for some people, not for us because we know there is dark matter, is the total mass is lined up here. Step back, remember the major component of visible material is gas in galaxy clusters. So the major component is here. If there was only gas and stars in galaxy clusters, lensing would find a peak of the mass distribution lined up with those two. It doesn't. It lines up with 
with the with the two clusters and it's exactly that factor of 10 that I approximately 10 that I told you before about that uh, that does it that we know there is a factor of 10 more material inside so everything fits together there is dark matter and even better what we figure out you remember I was telling you gas is very frictional turbulent so it stays behind it lags behind because the gas molecules interact with each other all the time. There is a lot of empty space between galaxies, so galaxies don't interact at all. And it turns out, because dark matter simply managed to fly through, that there is no uh, um, interaction between dark matter particles either. So this was the big thing about these observations, is that if you, if you look at this observation, it tells you that dark matter doesn't see each other. Even though there's so many, so much of it, it still doesn't, doesn't interact. It doesn't scatter. It doesn't do anything. It simply goes through as if there was nothing going on. And so this is why dark matter is so strange. Dark matter is a really strange thing because, um, because we don't know of any particle on Earth that would do that. Every single other material that we know of would scatter and would produce things like, like, uh, like the gas we see in the middle. So just to summarize, we know galaxies are only a tiny bit of the cluster, and the total mass doesn't line up with, the, with the, where the gas is. So this tells us dark matter is really there, and dark matter is here, where the blue thing is. So now just I want to show you another movie. This is a movie made by John Wise here at KIPAC. KIPAC is a joint institute between Stanford and Slack. It's been great working here because you have so many expertise around, around you. And so blue is dark matter, red is gas. And so you saw the two clumps of material smashing through each other. Dark matter doesn't interact, so it goes straight through. Gas interacts, and it's kind of mixing, and it stays in the middle creating a traffic jam, if you like. So this is now turning around. And the simulation that John performed exactly matches the data. So this is also why we know that um, we were right with what we saw. I'm just going to show it once again. So in the beginning, we had two clusters. I'm just going to repeat. Yeah. Well. In the beginning, we have two clusters. They both have their dark matter and gas. Now they're smashing through each other, creating this prominent shock, as it's called, um, just like on the water, going through. And then this is basically where we caught them in the act and observed them. So. Why is dark matter so difficult to detect? Well, for one, I told you it's very tough. Um, it's very, very difficult um, for dark matter to, to, to be uh, seen because it just doesn't interact with anything. It just flies straight through you. This is the annoying part about it. It interacts with itself and us only through gravity. So we know it's there because something is pulling us towards dark matter clouds. But there is no other way that we can really experience it. Because if you move your, your um, hand through the air, you still know the air is there because you feel the interactions. With dark matter, this is not the case. It's super abundant. So every other particle ever detected here on Earth, it's only a fifth. Dark matter is five times more abundant. Yet. There are tiny densities here on Earth. So in this room, there are probably only a couple of dark matter particles. But there are a couple of dark matter particles in this room. We know that. Dark matter is mostly clustered in the center of galaxies. So that's why here on Earth, the density of the material we know is much, much higher. However, it's so much more of it. So it's really tough to detect dark matter. However, not all is lost. And especially here, being here at Slack is the most fantastic place you can be at if you are studying dark matter. Because not only can you work with astronomers who study dark matter in clusters and galaxies, the way I told you, there are also people who try to detect dark matter on Earth. Because that's 
the, our main goal basically is to catch dark matter here. And so this is an experiment that is going on here at Stanford and Slack. It's called Cryogenic Dark Matter Search, CDMS. And what this experiment does, it takes huge amount of material. Um, and basically, if there is dark matter around us every now and then, I told you the interactions are tiny, but they're not zero. So every now and then, a dark matter particle should interact with a regular atom and knock out its nucleus. Now, this happens all the time with regular particles, so you have to be very careful how you do this. And that's why those people have to go down into the mines. They have it in Sudan, in Minnesota. It's deep underground to shield from all the other particles that could do exactly the same thing. And they're trying to detect dark matter in, in this way. Further, yet another experiment, again going here at SLAC, this also at KIPAC, is um, GLAST. So what GLAST is going to do, GLAST is this satellite that is going to be launched up in space, and one of the people who work on GLAST is Peter Michelson, who is here, but don't ask me which one of them it is. <laughs> I couldn't quite tell. Um, so this, um, this observatory will be launched in, uh, launched in space, and what they will do is, well, there is not really that much dark matter on Earth, so you want to look where at where there is a lot of dark matter. So you would look at galaxy clusters, but they're so far away that that doesn't make sense. So the closest place to look at is our center of our galaxy. So they will look towards the center of our galaxy, and occasionally, maybe dark matter, there's so much dark matter there, occasionally maybe two particles will find each other, will, will scatter, will produce some other particles and photons, and hopefully we will be able to detect those photons and know, have a direct detection of dark matter. So this is GLAST, which will be launched in space next year, so keep your fingers crossed, everything will go well. And then finally, we can detect dark matter in accelerators. It would be great if we could just turn on our slack accelerator, but that one is not powerful enough, so we cannot really do that. So instead, um, they, were bil they are building a large hadron collider, which is um, an accelerator, 27 kilometers is the diameter. It's in Switzerland and France. It's built at CERN. So they will be, they will be colliding particles um, and look for basically dark matter emerging from those collisions. And even further down the line, even later, this is the big brother of our SLAX collider. It's called International Linear Collider. They will um, collide electrons and positrons uh, just because those uh, reactions are easier. So it's very exciting time for us. We have been, the dark matter has been postulated. Now astronomers are actually getting handle of it. They know what it is. They know properties uh, of it. And yet, there are all these other experiments now going on here on Earth and actually really trying to do the direct detection of dark matter. And I'm really happy to be here at Slack. I was super happy to be here at Slack the last three years. Unfortunately, I will be moving, but I'll be here back a lot. So it's a very exciting place to be. So let me just finish. I was telling you that we've been postulating dark matter for a long time, but it was only now that we really managed to catch it. And so let me finish by with a quote from Sean Carroll, which says, science is a collaborative effort between us and the universe. So we propose ideas, universe smacks them down <laughs> all the time. But occasionally it agrees. And in case of the bullet cluster, what was predicted is exactly what we found out at the end. Thank you very much. Approximately, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the real factor between the two is actually six and something. So that was 
you know, I was doing things approximately. I'm just trying to get the numbers. But yeah, you are right. Yeah, it's the same thing. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Uh, we don't. So when I told you that there are a couple, um, the question was, why do we think we know the mass of each individual dark matter particle? And the answer is, unfortunately, this is why all these accelerator exper collider experiments are going on, is exactly to be able to measure it. So astronomers can tell you what's the density of dark matter. So when I said there is a couple of dark matter particles in this room. I was assuming the now vanilla flavored model for, for dark matter, which is um, 100 times heavier than a neutron. So this is approximately the, the mass we believe it's in. Of course, if dark matter is 10 times heavier or 10 times lighter, it's going to be, you have to adjust those numbers accordingly. We don't really know yet what the mass is, but we definitely know dark matter particles are not black hole mass um, particles, so you cannot have something really big, something earth size, something brick size, so at least we have this um, um, feeling for it. But it's um, particle physics model have a wide range of what the mass is going to be, and we have to wait for LHC to really tell us what the dark matter mass is. Yes? Yeah, so there were many models that were trying to build up a universe out of baryonic material, but just not lighting it up. So the problem is how to build up the whole universe. Maybe you can get away in a galaxy, but if you, if you manage to put so much baryonic material inside such a small space, it will have to light up. In addition, this you could make a universe out of brick-sized material, but there is just no way that we know of that baryons could form brick-sized material. It's not, they, they will either um, coalesce further, and so the, the pr producing such a, such a universe would just be impossible. That's why we know it's not baryonic material. In addition, what we know is, I was telling you, it just doesn't interact. If it was molecules, they would interact. If it was anything that we know of from standard particle physics model, they would interact and we would see those interactions and we just don't. Yes. The hot gas in clusters is so hot because uh, clusters are extremely massive. So it's this gigantic potential well, then when the, uh, when the gas uh, gets in, it heats up immensely. Because the potential energy, if you're familiar with that term, of such a big bulk of material is just so high and it gets um, transferred to the kinetic energy of the gas. Yes? Yeah, you're, I need to tell the whole history of the universe in 30 seconds. Yes, you, we know universe is expanding from the measurements, and the reason why it's expanding and it's acceleratingly expanding is the dark energy that I didn't have time to talk about. Um, dark matter is clustered on a local scale, so our galaxy by itself, it's not flying apart because dark matter is holding it together. So our galaxy is not expanding but the whole universe is expanding, and so. And it started, it's also because it started with the Big Bang, and it made a big boom, and now it's all, all expanding. And if it were just made out of matter, a lot of matter, what would happen is eventually the gravity would win, and it would just collapse it back together. But because there isn't that much matter, and there is dark energy in addition, this is not happening. Yes? Uh, 
Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. <laughs> so the knowledge we acquire is basically the knowledge about our universe and um, how it's going to proceed and what's the history of it and what's the future of it. It all depends upon what dark matter is. And so this is basically the knowledge that we are seeking I'm very excited to know about what dark matter is, and um, basically this is what um, what we are going to learn. In addition, we know now there is a part in particle physics, so one part of particle physics cannot explain the universe, and so we want to know what's that part of particle physics. And on the way there, I'm sure there will be very important discoveries, which will possibly also applicable for what is happening here, but we first need to get there. Yes. So um, first question was, why do we know it's not black holes? Well, we know how much material there is in our, un in our galaxy, for example. And there is yet another aspect of lensing which is helping you here. Because if this material would be black hole size uh, objects, it would occasionally magnify the background stars. So if you look at the stars, they would occasionally um, brighten up and then be dim again. And so there were many projects which were looking for exactly that signature and they didn't find it. So we know now dark matter is not something very compact. It's not made out of machos, the way they were calling them, which is massive compact objects. So this is, um, this is for the dark matter. Um, the, Wilkins, the W map experiments, uh, basically what you see are the prim primordial fluctuations, how the universe was rippled. Um, and those temperature fluctuations actually correspond to density fluctuations. And you can then put these density fluctuations in a supercomputer, and RISA in a month's time is going to tell us a lot more about it, how to do this. But you, you populate them with particles, and then you can see how they evolve. You can see how these little tiny things get together, form bigger things, and by the end of the day, well, it's also by the end of many months, what you end up with is your universe. And you can see what structures have formed. And you can compare with what we see in our, in our universe. And you figure out it's not enough. You need to add dark matter to those density fluctuations. Otherwise, you are not making the universe right. So dark. Dark, so dark energy is entering here as well because it makes the universe expand. So if you would just have dark matter, the, the objects would collapse faster. And so you need something that is expanding as well. Um, WMAP wasn't really good in, in figuring exactly this out. Um, so WMAP alone um, is not good to tell you all, everything. But we have also looked at supernovae. And so we could actually measure how fast the universe expands from looking at objects at more and more distant. And that's how. I'm telling you here only a part of the story. Science is collaborative effort. Everybody adds its own piece of the puzzle. And it's only when those old pieces of puzzles come together is that I can present you the universe the way I presented you today. Yes. Blue is actually dark matter. Oh, yeah. No, the gas in the galaxies is only a minor fraction. Most of the gas is smoothly distributed throughout the whole cluster. But when I showed you the light side of the universe, this was all optical, so you didn't see that gas because it only shines in the x-rays. 
but it's distributed through the whole volume. So it's all in between the galaxies in a cluster. That's the major component. Yeah, what is the gas that's hidden inside the galaxies themselves? It's only a minor thing, so you can forget about it. Yes. So we are basically hoping that dark matter interacts because otherwise there is no way we are going to see it. But um, the limits that we are getting right now are still very above of what particle physics um, uh, models are assuming. So we are saying dark matter is not interacting and the interaction is less than such and such. Uh, the interaction that particle physics are, uh, people are hoping for is 100 it's 10 billion times lower. So it's a huge span still. We are still slightly into different worlds, but we are working, you know, we are improving our limits and they will improve their limits as well. So at the moment, all that particle physics people can tell us is that the interaction is lower than such and such because they don't see anything. Yes. So the characteristics that we know of, it cannot be too light, because if it's too light, it would move too fast and it wouldn't be able to, to uh, gravitationally form those structures. So neutrinos are not a good candidate, even though they hardly interact, so that might possibly be an answer. So we know they may have to be fairly massive and we can give the range in which we think that the mass of the particle is. Um, and the collider experiments, you know, please don't do that to me, but they might turn on and don't see anything. But even if they turn on and don't see anything, they will be able to say, okay, dark matter is not that. So let's, but we are very hopeful. I mean, the models are showing that they should see something. Yes. It's very well possible, especially for dark energy, we have no clue what it is. So um, yes, it can very well be a whole spectrum, but um, we still think nature is simple, so we are trying to explain it first with the most simplest model we can get away with. And so that's what we are working on. Yes. So supersymmetry predicts dark matter. One of the possible candidates and one of the very promising candidates is a super supersymmetri supersymmetric particle, supersymmetric partner. And so, yes, supersymmetry might be the answer. I mean, the way to tell is really detecting dark matter, telling what the mass is, and, and look for, for the signatures. Yes. The Big Bang happened so fast that it ra erased everything. So at that point, things are just flying, flying apart. But um, it's true that you can you can say um, you can basically, given your the mass of the dark matter particle, you you can predict what. Um, how should I best explain it? So um, the way universe expands, it's uh, at certain point dark matter becomes, is, uh, we call this a freeze out. I don't have a really good, good uh, way to explain it. But um, depending upon the mass, it also tells you how much of the dark matter there is going to be later. So there is um, a whole model that goes with that, but um, 
and basically the whole formation of first first atoms, first nucleons, and everything. So that, I mean, the the those things are taken into account for sure in our models. Yes. When you when you look at uh, what's the number of photons you receive as a function of energy, you get a very characteristic sharp peak at the position where dark matter equivalent to the dark matter mass. So if you see this characteristic spectrum, then we know it's dark matter. But it, you're right. I mean, this is a very valid point and people are working just on that is how to exclude the background, how to know it's not the background and it's indeed dark matter. And there's a lot of effort going on into this. Yes. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So I have explained to you that there is 25% of the density in our universe is dark matter and 70% is dark energy. What dark matter does is it keeps universe together. What dark energy does, it tries to, to, to explode it, basically, to get it, accelerate it. Yes. That's a very good question. It would probably win you the Nobel Prize if <laughs> if you can answer, but I mean, we we don't, they would basically just be non-interacting, just flying through with some typical velocities. Um, we know approximately how fast they should be moving and um, yeah, I mean, there will be just particles like any other except that they don't interact. Yes. Um, okay. Exactly. They don't scatter. I mean, Earth is very dense, and they still don't scatter. You were expecting to find uh, these materials in the uh, detectors. Yeah, but um, I mean, w how would you know that they scattered, right? They would barely scatter with the stars. They're, they wouldn't do anything necessarily to the star. The reason why these one-ton detectors can tell you something about it is because somebody actually goes and really looks for signals. You wouldn't you wouldn't see anything changing on it. Really depends how they fly in and what they do and you know it's, it's So Mar Marusha I can see you know there are still loads and loads of people wanting to ask uh, questions and there's a huge uh, subject of discussion going on here. So we have prepared for this. We have brought cookies. And <laughs> <laughs> we think ahead in research. So outside there are cookies. There are also people wearing these special dark matter baseball caps, which we also designed for this evening. These are also very knowledgeable people who will be able to answer uh, questions for you. And I'm sure Marusha will uh, stay on here for a bit.